I have been ecstatically waiting for this guest to appear on, and we have finally made it happen. She is a very important person. She is a dominant force in sports media, so I don't know how I got on her schedule. It is Lauren DeFord, supervising producer of Golf Channel. That is a relatively new job for her, but she has been dominating in the sports media world and went to Syracuse and has so many stories, and we're going to talk about those stories and highlight her. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Lauren, thanks again so much for doing this. And I wanted to start here. When do you feel Frank DeFord's voice, his spirit most in what you do and when you live and in any walk of life? It's such a good question. Um, And it's really funny because I was just talking to Jaime Diaz, who's one of my colleagues at Golf Channel. And I was telling him, Jaime, our relationship reminds me so much of my relationship with my late father-in-law. We laugh, but we can be smart and talk about stories. And Jaime, like Frank, see his pattern in the chaos, right? And they can see stories from a 35,000 feet. They're able to kind of put a historical perspective on things, but still have fun with it. Um, and so we were talking about that and Jaime is really a storyteller and I, I wanted to kind of tell him how much I appreciated that and also how much I appreciated him interviewing people and how Every time he interviews someone, they say, good question. And he reminds me so much of Frank. So my new colleague at Golf Channel, I see him every day. Um, But Frank, you know, he he was a second father to me. Um, I actually met my husband. This is so funny. Everyone assumes that I met him through sports broadcasting, but I met him on Match.com before it was okay to be. (laughs) Before (laughs) all that was all right. Um, And when I met him, um, you know, it all kind of like clicked because One of the things, and I can't believe we're going to get into this, but one of the things that was so funny about my dating previously to meeting Chris was men didn't understand my schedule. They didn't understand why I would root um, for the Yankees to lose because it would make my (laughs) life easier. Um, And he got all that because that was how he grew up. So, um, you know, it, it... I fit, I fit right into the family and I definitely felt like I had a kindred spirit in Frank and I miss him every day. I have seen this picture, Lauren, I think of one of your children sitting in Frank's lap when, when one of your children was super young, I think it was on your Instagram. Mm-hmm. When, when you think of that moment in time, what comes to mind? Wow. Um, you know, both of my children, and I don't know who it was because they've both sat on his lap. I wonder which one it was, but um, I see Frank and both of my children, um, especially my son. My son is super smart. And I, I use the line patterns in the chaos again. He, he's only eight, but he draws these conclusions that someone much older would draw, just like Frank would in his sort of erudite intellectual way. Um, so both of my children remind me so much of, of Frank, um, you know, in their sense of humor, in their intelligence. My son certainly loves to read and write. Um, I don't want to throw my daughter under the bus, but my son definitely, <laughs> definitely Hunter loves to read and write. Um, and, and I think, you know, they, they certainly, he had a huge impact on both of their lives. Um, they called him Big Daddy, which was what he wanted to be called. You know, he is from a Southern family in Richmond, Virginia. And I think that's what he had called his own grandfather. So they always talk about Big Daddy and they'll get tears in their eyes and they'll say, we miss Big Daddy. And you no, know, but we talk about him all the time. And I feel that his own impact is being seen through you and what you're doing to this day. You have people around you that remind you of him, but also I'm sure you as well have some character traits of Frank. And when you got the job at Golf Channel, you had been out of work, if I'm not mistaken, Lauren, for like four four months or so. Yep, that's about right. How did you grow in those four months? Another excellent question. So I think that... I was really surprised to have been let off or laid off by um, SNY. I didn't think it was going to happen. Obviously, you know, there's a global pandemic outside and you know that that stuff, stuff's going to change, but I was, I was definitely taken by surprise. Um, my job there was mainly overseeing the early shows and, and they got canceled. Um, one of the shows I, I oversaw, uh, Loudmouse was sponsored by Cheapo Air. Obviously, there's no air travel, you know, all that. But I still didn't, I didn't see it coming. Um, and it was a very, very tough time for me. Um, I think that 
I have wrapped up a lot of my identity in, in my career. And, um, you know, it was difficult. I tried very hard though, to realize that I wasn't probably ever going to have this time off again, you know? So I got in really good shape. Um, I did a lot of yoga. I did a lot of walking. Um, I did, you know, I did a lot of stuff with my kids that frankly, being a working mother, it's very hard to do. So um, when September came around, I made it a point to do pickup and and drop off and got to know the other moms, like all that kind of, sometimes the grass is greener on the other side. And you think to yourself, oh, you know, look at all these stay-at-home moms. They must have such a great life. And I got to know them a little bit, you know, and and I'm not saying they don't have a great life, but I'm just saying there's pluses and minuses to, to everything. And learning that I think was really valuable. We're joined by Lauren DeFord with Golf Channel. I'm Brian Fenley, a national anchor at Fox Sports Radio. So then you go into the fall and Golf Channel has some interest in you. And apparently the feeling is mutual. How did this marriage, so to speak, come to fruition? So, um, you know, what I say all the time is in this industry, relationships are so important. So I was, you know, I was Google searching. I, you know, I, I had my connections looking for me, but honestly, Brian, there wasn't a lot out there as you can imagine. And I saw on Indeed or or one of the job boards that there was a supervising producer at at Golf Channel um, available. And I've known Molly Solomon um, since 2004 when she asked me to produce sailing for her in Athens. Um, I wasn't able to do that. Uh, I had committed, you know, I was working at WNBC at the time and I was running their operation in Athens, but I was able to work for her in 2006 in Torino and run the Olympic zone. Um, So Molly and I had known each other 16 years. I always kept in touch. We check each other's social media. I'd always had tremendous amount of respect for Molly and her work, her work ethic, what she can do, the way that she teaches. So I I dropped her a really casual note and I said, Molly, do you think I'd be a good fit for this? And she said, absolutely, apply. And honestly, it was like one thing led to another. It was, it was awesome. I had a meeting with Matt Hagerty, who's now my boss, who's incredible. Jeff Russell, who was the executive editor and Molly's husband, who I actually had never met. And we clicked and it, it was, um, it was just one of those things that it may have been three weeks from the first email to Molly to actually getting the job. It was meant to be. And if I'm not mistaken as well, Lauren, you have worked, is it five Olympics? I think yeah, I might have five Olympics, five Olympics. And one of the one one person that you've been able to to know and have certainly worked with over the years and even probably done some Olympic work with is Bruce Beck. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to ask you about how your life is different having a, a man like Bruce Beck in your life, knowing what he's done in this industry and knowing the effect that he's had on you. Wow, I was going to bring Bruce up. So <laughs> <laughs> I love Bruce. He was at my wedding. He's a mentor. He's a friend. You know, the best comparison is an uncle, you know, but he's he's a mentor, a friend, and a colleague. And I talk to him all the time. So I first met Bruce when I was a production assistant at WNBC. Um, and he taught me so much. We, we needed an anchor, a weekend anchor. We tried him out. It was sort of like love at first sight. And I remember maybe the second or third week, I cut a devil's highlight for him. And I forgot to write that the devils were playing. I just, it was just like Canadians, whatever. And in the blue, you know, wh- whatever it was. And he, he looks at me and he says, Spence, that was my nickname because my maiden name was Spencer. He goes, in the future, can you please write devils in the highlight? And I just started laughing. <laughs> I said, yeah, I gotcha. You know, so his, um, you know, his attention to detail is absolutely unparalleled. Um, But the biggest thing that Bruce taught me, and I brought this up before, is the importance of relationships. So Bruce is the kind of guy that will get up at the crack of dawn, go to Giants practice, go to Knicks practice, you know, try call Louis Carnesecca and try to swing by his house for a quick one on one run to the six o'clock show, get that done, go get a haircut, come back for the 11. He'll work an 18 hour day religiously all the time. But what I learned was that the PR guys and the players, they really appreciated the fact that he was on at 11 20 at night and he was at their practice at nine in the morning and it didn't go unnoticed. And 
when he needed something, he would, people would say the same thing, anything for you, Bubba. They would say anything for you. And, you know, it, it's, it's just the kind of thing, his dedication and his craft, um, you know, people notice and he's a good guy and people notice. So I would say I try to live my life that way. That's super powerful. What a testament to him. What's an unsolicited good deed that's happened to you, that's benefited you? We, we talk about what Bruce has done to help others. What about something that's happened to you that this changed maybe the trajectory of your own career? Well, Golf Channel recently had this thing with, with Ann Woth, um, the Augusta National Women's Amateur. And um, it was an initiative where you could nominate a mentor and if they were elected, um, you would receive a magnolia tree. And my new colleague, who I feel like I've known forever, Anna Whiteley, did and, and nominated me and wrote the most beautiful note on the nomination. And she said, Lauren, we're so lucky to have you. You're a force, your energy, your can-do attitude. You know, I, we're so grateful to have you on this team and it's only just beginning. And I got the tree and it, it's, it's on the way. And it meant so much to me that someone went out of their way to do something like that. Um, you know, it was a small gesture, but it, it meant the world to me and the sentiment meant the world to me. So that was a couple of weeks ago and I shared it with, you know, a lot of my close friends and family, like how much it meant to me. I had a moment with Anne. I said, Anne, I'm practically in tears. And she said, I am too. <laughs> so um, yeah, just little stuff like that. But, you know, if you go back a little bit, Molly, Molly didn't have to hire me. I mean, she probably had a hundred people for the job. I mean, and, and the fact that she was, you know, willing to take a chance on someone who's not a golf expert, um, but she knew that I would, I would bust my ass for her. Um, you know, that's, that's another one. Taking that hard work, what, what is it like as far as your demeanor in the control room and, and, and how you've been able to, to navigate that space in, in the short time that you've been at Golf Channel? So Brian, it's so funny. We've been in two different control rooms. Um, the first control room is called PCR8 in Stanford and the CP sits in like a little audio booth. So that's been difficult because I have to, you know, talk to everyone over headset. Um, there have been times where, and I try not to be a screamer, but there have been times where I've come out like, what's going on? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I try to remain calm, positive. Um, what I really try to do is prove that any problem is solvable, whether it's we have to dummy a segment up or we have to make a break longer or we have to switch from something called vMix, which is a, like Skype um, to FaceTime, or we're gonna we're going to float the guest into the next block. So, you know, again, I I try to bring those TV skills to, to golf channel. Um, because I've done a lot of breaking news in my life. And, you know, at the beginning, when, when we moved from Orlando, everything was new to everybody. So there were some ghosts in the machines. Um, so what I try to do is just say, we'll get through this. There's a way, you know, everybody remain calm because, you know, control rooms, let's face it, are, are you know, by nature, stressful places. Um, and show them tricks that I know. And, you know, if we have this problem again, okay, last week we did this, we switched to FaceTime, we added a break, we did this. Um, and that's what I'm trying to bring is, is like, let's get, let, let me show you how to get out of situations. We're talking with Lauren DeFord, supervising producer of Golf Channel. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. As far as handling those tumultuous times when breaking news happens, what's the one instance, like if you were to hang on your mantle, a trophy of the best time, a, a segment of programming where things went awry and you loved the way you handled yourself under that pressure on television, what is that? Well, recently it's the Tiger Woods incident, you know, where he, where he got into the car accident. We didn't know if he was alive. Um, Matt Hagerty, our, our boss came into uh, the newsroom and he was sort of white and he's very energetic, you know, normally as a guy. And he very quietly said, Tiger's been in an accident. And we went and, and um, 
you know, I used all my local news skills. I got the KNBC chopper up. I got the pictures routed into the uh, control room. So it wasn't just talking heads. It was, we were able to go to, to the chopper video of the car. I mean, it, and that was something I was really proud of because this is a news story. So stuff that, you know, so that I know how to do, I was able to bring to Golf Channel, well, frankly, is not gonna have a huge amount of, you know, major breaking stories. It's not like you're working at WNBC, right? So um, I was on a um, Teams call with a bunch of, of the higher ups at NBC Sports and they were sort of suggesting things and telling us what we could and could report and calmly, you know, letting the producer know what we could do, where we're going, all that. I felt we did about eight hours and I felt amazing at the end of that. I felt I felt absolutely amazing. Um, sadly, before that, there, there's a lot of death that we've done. You know, Gary Carter, I felt, sounds horrible, but I felt good about the coverage that we, you know, were able to produce um, at SNY. Um, I remember Joe Torrey getting fired at, at WNBC and we cut into programming and at a local station, you got like Ellen on, you never do stuff like that. And I, I was incredibly proud of how we handled that. Um, I think it was A-Rod coming to the Yankees um, and he was about 40 minutes late to the press conference and I was field producing at, a, at the old Yankee Stadium. I got John Sterling to come on. I mean, busy, busy people that really probably didn't want to do it. I got Susan. I mean, the whole nine yards just to fill, you know, I think my instincts are really good with that kind of stuff. You said earlier in this conversation, Lauren, that you were maybe one of a hundred people that Molly was looking for as far as applications. When I hear the way you handle that Tiger Woods story, that's why she hired you because of the way you operated under those circumstances, under that pressure. So I know you're being humble, but th there was a reason to all of this happening. When you were at SNY, if I'm not mistaken as well, you had the opportunity to work with Kevin Burkhart and- Briefly, yeah, for the first yeah. couple of years. This is before he sort of blew up. What did you yeah. see in him early on that sort of gave you a, a premonition that he one day was going to be the person he is today? That's, that's another great question. You know, Kevin is just so natural and likable and easy to get along with. And the fact that he was all those things gave him great relationships with the players. And so we go back to the relationships piece. You know, um, people wanted to talk to him. Kevin knew a lot of stuff. Um, as a producer working with Kevin, I was always excited to work with Kevin. I'd be like, cool, I get to talk to Burkhart, you know? Um, he was just, he was a gem, easy to work with, pleasant, um, smart, good voice. You know, I I didn't know that he would be this big, but I'm not surprised that he is. Um, and, and he's just so great at what he does. But, you know, he's a relationship builder. I think before he came to SNY, a couple of jobs before, he worked uh, as a car salesman in Eatontown, New Jersey. Um, and he learned how to deal with people and, and he certainly, he certainly knew how to deal with people and players and, and, and to get the most out of them. What was Mike Yam like as an intern? <laughs> he was great. He was one of those guys that, uh, God, it's so funny. Yeah. I interviewed at ESPN once I saw him in the, uh, in the cafe, he was just really a go-getter. And, you know, you knew like, we had a ton of great interns at, at WNBC. He's definitely like, you know, on Mount Rushmore. Um, you know, he was a great interviewer. I, I always would, would be worried about sending interns out in the field. Are they gonna you know, somehow embarrass us or do something, <laughs> you know, like, do something I'm gonna hear about, you know, that kind of thing. And, and Yam, I just, sorry, this is really bright. I, I, uh, I never was worried about Yam and what he could do. And, you know, you just got the feeling that he was a natural. And, you know, like just, again, a good guy, a good guy. And I, I was always rooting to succeed for him to succeed. And he actually got laid off around the same time I did and was able to get a new job around the same time I was. So definitely always felt um, a connection with him. Um, Spiro Ditas interned for me. Um, oh, he did? Jesse, I know Spiro. Oh, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Jesse Palmer interned for me, The Bachelor. <laughs> He was QB two at the time, but or even QB three at the time. But um, yeah, that was that was a lot of fun too. We've had some we've had some gems. Ed Cohen, intern for me. It's like a, yeah, it's like a future Hall of Fame. 
yeah, it's it's broadcasting Hall of Fame in the future, all of these interns that you've had. And when you speak about SNY out in the field, I saw this picture, Lauren, of Flav of Flav, like taking over a live shot or something <laughs> like that. Like explain this scenario, this scenario and, and what was happening. So this was an indie, the last time the Giants were in the Super Bowl and, and Gary Apple is with, um, God, who was it? Um, it wasn't Ralph Vacchiano. Oh, he was with Mike Garofolo. And uh, somehow Flav of Flav is walking around, you know, he's a Giants fan, I guess, with his clocks on him. And one of the field producers just grabbed him and brought him over to the live <laughs> shot. And, and, and Apple and Garofolo are, are talking to him and, you know, there's, you know what time it is. And it, it, it was just an absolute classic moment. And everyone working that night will never forget. Like the time Flav and Flav came on Geico Sports Night. Um, no, but it was, it was so funny. And, and it went down, it kind of like goes down in history as one of those funny, funny moments. Uh, Apple still talks about it. How about the time your kids made their Golf Channel TV appearance? Oh, the time I, I gave them the clubs. <laughs> yeah, was it? Yeah, it was, you gave them the clubs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was good. Golf Channel has been really good about you know merch and, and swag. I went down to uh, Orlando when I first started for the first Masters, and um, there was just tables full of Golf Channel stuff. I was just like, this is this is unbelievable. So, um, Golf Channel does a merchandise show uh, every year. This year was very scaled down because of COVID. Um, <laughs> but there were a set of kids club. My producer, Chloe Pistorius, who's fantastic. She goes, Hey, why don't you have Annabelle and Hunter model these clubs? I'm thinking to myself, yes. you know, I'll just put them in the back seat of the car, you know? And so now we have these golf clubs. Um, but you know, I took, I had my husband take them out to central park and they were swinging the club and Annabelle, you know, doing one of those. And, uh, you know, they definitely dug it. And my daughter is very funny. She gets very shy and bashful. She's like, Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. And Hunter, Hunter plays baseball and he's been playing since he was two. So, I mean, he, you know, like he knows how to swing something, but it, it, it made me laugh. And, you know, I do think, um, you know, my dad played golf and he was really, he was really good, like a five or six handicap. Um, and, never taught me. Um, he taught me tennis, but never taught me golf. In the 70s growing up, like girls really didn't play golf. And I told Chris, uh, who also was a very good golfer, probably about a three handicap, that we really need to teach the kids how to play golf. I think it's an important life skill. I'm not very good. You know, I wish I, I really wish I was better. And, you know, it's, it's something I regret, but I'm going to work on it. You are going to work on it. Yeah, you can absolutely. get better there at any age anybody can improve. And so I look forward to seeing those improvements. And I wanted to finish up with this. Lauren DeForge was with us with Golf Channel. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Where do you get the most self-validation in what you do in sports media? It's a really, really intelligent question. I think when a segment comes together, like even if it's an unlikely segment, sometimes we do things, you know, and I, I've been overseeing golf today, which is a relatively new show. And my philosophy has been, I mean, I want to make it a talk show and a conversation show and an interview show, but who are the interview subjects, right? Well, I, I want to have it be interesting interview subjects. So we did a, a segment on the fact that on the moon landing, the astronauts swung a golf club and we had a NASA historian come on and we had all the pictures and we had the song Man on the Moon as we went to break and it all came together. And it could have been an absolute disaster. Like, why are they doing this whole thing? But it was perfect. And I, I felt so much validation in the fact that I'd taken a swing, right? You know, I'm not, I, I guess I, I want to just say it's, my philosophy is is like, just take a shot, shoot your shot. I mean, even if it's a disaster, it's five minutes of TV. And, you know, like it's not brain surgery. It's not the end of the world. But I, I think the positives completely outweigh the negatives of, of trying things. We tried something and it worked. That's when I feel validation. Lauren DeFord, validation with what she does as the supervising producer of the Golf Channel. Also, there must be so many validating qualities to being a mother of two as well. Lauren, thank you so much for this. This is a, a pleasure to reflect upon your life. And I'm so proud of you, your persistence, your determination. And Golf Channel is better off with you in that building. I'm Brian Fenley. Thanks so much.